Good morning, brothers and sisters. I'm Father Michael. For those of you who are new or visiting, welcome. There are Connect cards in the seat backs in front of you. So if you're new and would love to get in contact with us, we would love to get into contact with you. So if you could fill that out. And when the offering basket comes around before communion, you can just drop it in there. We've got a couple of announcements since we're not doing announcements in Lent. In your seats, you will find these little cards for Easter lilies. So if you would like to... Um, donate Easter lilies in memory or in honor of someone, please go ahead and fill that out. And um, you can put it in the offering basket, drop it off at church um, leading up to Easter. And there's also a drop down menu on Church Center that you can go to if you want to donate online and don't want to fill out paper. Um, Also, uh, table for eight, registration is closing today. At 2 p.m. So if you um, are interested in taking part in that, we've got a whole host of people who are interested in taking part in Table for Eight. If you're interested in that, go ahead and sign up today. This is the last day. We'll close registration and then, uh, you know, eventually somewhere down the road we'll open it up again. But um, if you would like to be part of this round, please go ahead and do that today. Let's pray. Almighty God, we come before you this morning ready to hear the truths of our faith, of what you have done in Jesus Christ, and of how we might enter your kingdom, Lord. So focus on heart, our hearts on that this morning, God. We make ourselves available and ready before you. Teach us by your spirit and by your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we're exploring some very fundamental truths of the faith, what it means to be born again and born of water in the spirit controversial passages. So um, I'm sure there are a whole host of thoughts about those words in the congregation today, and we'll try to parse out what those things mean. So go ahead and open up to John chapter 3, because that's where we're going where to be pretty much the whole time. So this week, the Old Testament lesson is a snapshot of the story of God's righteousness, where he enters a covenant with Abraham And Abraham's faith, we're told, is counted to him as righteousness because he trusts in the promises of God. And the New Testament lesson from Romans 4 also focuses on Abraham's faith. All who trust in the promises of God and Jesus Christ are now made children of Abraham. Whether Jew or Gentile, you're justified and counted righteous before God by faith. God is the one who does the justifying, not us. It's important always to remember that. We don't justify ourselves by works of the law, but by trusting in what God has promised and what God has done in Jesus. And because God saves us, the original promise to Abraham is fulfilled. There's all that talk about who will my children be? Am I going to get the land? God, what, how are you going to do this? How are you going to accomplish this? And in Genesis 22, a few chapters after the chapter uh, you heard today, God says this to Abraham. In your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So in a very real sense, Jesus is that offspring of Abraham. And through Jesus, all the nations of the earth are blessed, because salvation has arrived in him. And you and I are adopted sons and daughters of God through Jesus. So those who trust in the promises of God and Jesus are as the words of the gospel text say today, born of water and the spirit are forgiven of their sins, counted righteous before God, and made heirs with Christ in his kingdom. So what does it mean to be born again and born of water and the spirit? Because Jesus says it's required to enter the kingdom of God. So it's kind of important, I think, that we get a handle on what exactly that means. So that brings us to our gospel passage today. So Jesus is talking to this man, Nicodemus, who's a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish ruling council. This is a very important man. And he comes to Jesus in the middle of the night, probably because he does not want to be seen with Jesus in public. Got to protect the reputation. Because Jesus is this working class son of a carpenter. He's a controversial teacher. He's a miracle worker. But Nicodemus recognizes Jesus' wisdom, and that the power of God is with Jesus and in Jesus. And he tells Jesus as much, and Jesus doesn't respond, thank you very much, I appreciate the compliment, I appreciate you recognizing that. No, he says the very Jesus thing to say. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again or born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. To which Nicodemus replies, what are you talking about? How can someone be born again? What, what are you saying, Jesus? So that little phrase at the end of that verse, to see the kingdom of God, it means to enter the kingdom and have a part in the final establishment of God's rule here on earth. It's like setting your eyes on the promised land and setting foot in it. Very Old Testament kind of notion there. And for a first century Jew and a Pharisee like Nicodemus, when he hears that word, kingdom of God, he's going to be thinking about something in an age to come, at the end of an age to come. And as a good Pharisee, he believes it would involve the resurrection and the coming of the Messiah. But what he's missed is that the kingdom of God is standing right in front of him in Jesus, that the establishment of God's rule is wearing peasant clothes and has rough hands right in front of him. Jesus says in verse 6, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Nicodemus knows that Jesus is something more than the flesh, but he hasn't quite connected the dots to understand the spirit in what Jesus is saying and doing. For now, Nicodemus has missed the truth of Jesus's message, but And this should be a message of hope to all of us, because if you'll remember, that's not where Nicodemus' story ends. Because you see, at the end of John, he is one of the two men who are helping prepare Jesus for his burial. I did some calculations, some conversions. He donates 54 pounds of myrrh for Jesus' burial. That is a lot of myrrh. So I think that that's a sign that Nicodemus probably does eventually get what it means to be born again and to enter the kingdom of God. So what does that mean, born again? It's got a lot of baggage, that phrase. For some of you who hear born again, you're probably thinking of revivals or of intense conversion experiences, or you think of particular political loyalties, unfortunately. So I want to spend time answering that question, what does it mean to be born again? Because it's kind of central to the meaning of this whole passage. So one option is that being born again could mean moral renewal. But I don't think that's primarily what it's about. And this is why. Nicodemus, standing in front of him, is not someone who really needs moral renewal. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He's all about moral and societal and religious renewal. These are, in a very real sense, moral men. And so if moral renewal is the focus of being born again, then Nicodemus is born again, but Jesus is here telling him, you must be born again. So it can't be that. I think it's an implication of being born again, but that's not really the focus because the Pharisees are rigorously moral. And so related to that, what is it about living out the law, the Torah, more faithfully? I think that option is foreclosed to us as well, as Paul says in Romans 4 today. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham, and, uh, sorry, and now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. It's not about works of the law. It's not about circumcision. It's not about more faithfulness to the law. That's not what being born again is about. Paul focuses on faith, and we'll get to that in a second. Okay, so it's not moral renewal, it's not obedience to the law. Is it a conversion experience? Is that what being born again means? And I think that that can be part of what it means to be born again, but not necessarily. Not in the traditional sense that we think of conversion experiences, at least. I mean, think of Saul on the road to Damascus, struck down, has this vision, this encounter with Jesus Christ, the risen Lord, is blinded, and then becomes Paul and then goes on a Gentile, you know, a mission to the Gentiles and ultimately to his own death and martyrdom. That's quite the conversion story. And for some people, that is exactly what it means to be born again. But not for everyone. Because when I think about this, I don't ever want my children to have a conversion experience because I don't want them to have to have a conversion experience. My great hope is that having been raised in the church, baptized into this body and the, the body of Christ universal, that they would always live in deepening understanding 
of their relationship with Jesus Christ, of their salvation in him. That's, that's the great hope, right, for every parent. That oftentimes doesn't happen because the world is at work, the devil is at work, but that's our hope. I had a recent conversation with one of our youth about this exact point. So he was talking to a number of his friends who are part of a tradition where having a, a conversion experience is like essential to being a Christian. Like if you haven't had a conversion experience, there's some real questions about your salvation. But this is a young man who has been raised in the church his whole life, who was baptized in the church, has been taught the scriptures, has been taught to pray, and by every indication is living deeper and deeper into his relationship with the Lord and doesn't remember a time where he did not believe in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Are we here to say this young man has not been born again? No, because every indication is that he indeed has when he was baptized. And so it can't be the conversion experience. So what is this being born again about? I think ultimately it's about inner renewal of the soul. And I don't think this is a particularly controversial thing to say. It's inner renewal of the soul. It's what is dead coming to life. And it's necessary to see the kingdom of God. So what's the source of that inner renewal of the soul? It's the power of God to regenerate the world that's brought into the present. So the final restoration of all things we believe as Christians, Christians is going to happen by God's power at the end of time. But it's not just left then. It's breaking in now. That restoration has begun now in you and in me and Jesus Christ. And so Nicodemus, for example, thought that the kingdom of God was something far off. But in Jesus, it's come near. It's breaking in now. And so because the kingdom of God is near, the power of the kingdom of God is near. So Jesus is already remaking creation through the Holy Spirit that's at work in you and in me. And the effects of that inner renewal may take a long time to work out. Indeed, it takes a lifetime to work out. But that doesn't mean that the Spirit has not planted new life in you. That's a message of great hope, especially for those who stumble along, as many of us do in our sanctification, that new life has been planted in me, and it continues to work itself out. So just some examples of what it looks like for Jesus to bring new creation into the present in his own time. Um, well, the incarnation is one of them, right? So he's charting a course for humanity to walk behind him, to enter into renewal and newness of life through him. Uh, he's putting bodies back in order. When Jesus heals, he's taking away sickness and destruction from the body and casting it aside so that there will be wholeness of life there in our flesh. He's casting out demons. So for his people, he's taking the... Um, the soldiers of darkness, in separating them from those who he loves. This is all part of renewal. He's hallowing food as a means of grace. This is my body. This is my blood. He's hallowing water for our baptism. This is the work of renewal going on, and it's going on in each and every one of our hearts who have faith in Jesus. So what does this mean? What's the ultimate kind of payout from this? Is that there's hope for everyone. No one is beyond the power of God to be born again. Jesus says the wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. And so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. I'm one of those people. I was not following the Lord. I didn't care at all about the Lord. I was more interested in the flesh and the world and the devil, as the prayer book puts it. But the Lord pursued me. The Lord pursued me, and he pursues all of those people for whom the world, the flesh, and the devil seems a far more important thing to them than Jesus. And so that means for us that we have to constantly pray for those people and be available to witness to those people because you and I might be the means of grace by which those people are born again. And for some, the Spirit might be like water dripping through that little crack in the dam, but the Spirit will widen that sliver more and more and more and overflow the barriers of the human heart. And that's why we've got to pray and got to witness and love those people who seem far from God. And the second thing, not only is there hope for all, but also it's all God and not me, this being born again. It doesn't, it doesn't really involve me all that much. It involves something that God has done and is doing. 
We don't do anything to be born. I mean, think about the metaphor, being born. None of you remember being born. We just simply received life when we came into the world, before we came into the world, out of our mothers. And seeing God's kingdom requires that much on our part. We have to be granted new life as a gift of God in order to see the kingdom. It's a gift, and we can't take it for ourselves. We just hold out our hands to receive it. That's it. It's like the beggar reaching out his hands just to receive anything that you're willing to give him. That's our posture before the Lord in receiving new birth. But Nicodemus still doesn't really get it, uh, even after he's insulted by Jesus. Um, It's a good way to teach, you know, to to insult the people you're trying to teach. Um, So Jesus does what every good teacher does, and he repeats himself, but he makes it more complicated the second time around so that the student is more confused than he was the first time. You know, I've never done that as a teacher ever in my entire life. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So being born again to new life in the kingdom is now connected not just with new birth, but with water and the spirit. So what does that mean? And this is a very controversial verse. There are all kinds of different interpretations of it, some better than others. These are some that have been offered. Um, Just a a couple that I stumbled across. So um, one interpretation, I think a popular one probably, is that Uh, Water is representative of natural birth and the spirit of, obviously, spiritual birth. This reading makes no sense because, obviously, the person who is spiritually reborn has been born, like, from a a mother. So this this reading doesn't make any sense to me. Another one. Uh, People have said that the water is merely a metaphor for the spirit, and then there is also the spirit. But this also doesn't really make any sense because why would you say you must be born of a metaphor for a thing and the thing? So none of these interpretations are good. And I'll be honest, the consensus view before the 16th century was that this verse is about baptism and rebirth by the Holy Spirit. That is what this text is about. So Paul in Romans 6, uh, just a few chapters after um, what we read today, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life, in the born-again new life. So just after Paul has said, faith is credited to you uh, as righteousness, in baptism we enter Christ's death and are raised to him through the power of God, to new life. And that isn't a work of the flesh. That isn't a work of the law. It has nothing to do with that because baptism is about what the Holy Spirit is doing in the person baptized through the mundane means of water. A little onwards uh, in Titus, Paul's letter to Titus, which is a great, go read this this afternoon. I just reread Titus again. It's a short letter and it's just so full of spiritual encouragement. He says, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, because that's what this is all about, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life, the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit parallels being born of water and the Spirit quite nicely. So God, through baptism by water and the Spirit, is remaking us, each and every one of us, into people who can see and experience the kingdom of God. Fullness of life with God, even in the midst of this world, even in the midst of all of the death and the evil and the turmoil and the sin around us, and that we continue to battle. We get to see the kingdom of God. We get to see God at work in our midst, in our own lives. So I kind of think of baptism a little like the wardrobe in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. So from the outside, the wardrobe is just an old piece of furniture filled with old coats and mothballs in an ordinary room in a large and old house in the English countryside. And you step through it, and one has entered a world beyond the ordinary, the secular, the worldly, the fleshly, 
way of seeing things and into a miraculous world full of wonder and possibility. And that is what it means to receive the inner renewal of the heart that occurs in baptism and through the power of the Holy Spirit. You're coming out of the domain of darkness where, where there are German bombers bombing London, out of that world and into the world of the kingdom of God. So what's the role of faith in all of this? Because you're probably thinking about that. Baptism can't be considered apart from faith. On the one hand, it's not just merely symbol, a symbolic add-on to faith, but on the other hand, baptism is not a replacement for faith. It's not a get-out-of-jail-free card. It's not the, oh yeah, I was baptized that one time, and now I will go and live my life as I please, loyal to other things in the kingdom of God. Just to remind you of Jesus' great commission to all of us, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Pass on the faith and baptized. The problem, I think, for us in our current context and why this causes confusion is that we think of faith and baptism separated from each other. But a good exercise is to go back through the book of Acts and look at all of the instances of people coming to faith and look at all the instances of baptism. And those things always occur very closely together. And this doesn't mean that God is not at work in someone who has not been baptized. Far from it. I want to just make clear to everyone. That's clearly not true. The Holy Spirit is always doing unseen work in people's hearts all the time. And coming to faith is a gift. Being baptized is a gift. It's grace all the way down for us as Christians. So as one recent writer puts it, this is the Anglican view of baptism. Baptism really delivers God's gift of new birth. But this gift has to be received. And where it is not received, then the gift is unfruitful. Someone who is baptized is truly born again, but this fact is of no spiritual benefit to them unless they live out the new life that God has given them. Baptism is the point at which the forgiveness of sins, one baptism for the remission of sins, and adoption as God's children are actually bestowed on those who are baptized. And the Holy Spirit is the effective agent who bestows the benefits of baptism on us. Just as a, I mean, just as a quick aside, I got a gift from a former student, which is a, a, like a little bulb, a plant, that you, know, you can plant and water and all those things. It's sitting in a box right now because I don't really do plants. But, um, but the bulb is there. And if I were to plant it and water it and give it sun and take care of it, which I'm very bad at and don't really know how to do, then it would grow. But if it just sits there in the box, it's not doing anything. It is of no benefit to me. And while that's not a perfect analogy, that's something like what Anglicans believe about baptism. So the result of being born again and being born of water and the Spirit, it's inner renewal. It's forgiveness of sins. It's regeneration of the heart. It's adoption as heirs with Christ. It's a new identity. We're no longer loyal to the domain of darkness, but loyal to the kingdom of God because we bear the mark of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit upon us. As little babies given new birth, we grow into the maturity to which God has called us. I mean, that's, that is the work that Therese is doing in our children here. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the foundation of this new birth, especially in the season of Lent. And this is where we'll end. So Jesus says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So when, in, when Israel wandered in the darkness and was attacked by venomous snakes, God commanded Moses to make a pole with a bronze serpent on it so that whenever people looked upon the serpent, serpent they'd, dis, they'd recover from the snake bites. And it's a really strange story, as many Genesis stories are, and Jesus has told us its meaning. Jesus is raised up on a cross in the form of sinful flesh, yet without sin, and he takes the poison of sin upon himself and away from us if we just look upon him and trust in the cross and in his power to heal us. So gazing upon the cross of Christ is not a one-time deal. 
The foot of the cross is our ongoing place we come to for repentance. Always, I mean, all the time, should be daily, week in and week out at the very least. And certainly during the season of Lent, you're reminded of it, it's shoved in your face. You had that sign put upon your forehead on Ash Wednesday. So that trust in Christ, that does a lot of work. It's the mark by which God has chosen to justify us before him. It's the means by which we receive all the grace that God wants to give us by faith, whether in baptism, whether in the Lord's Supper, whatever means of grace God chooses to use, we receive it by faith. Faith is the centerpiece. And so when we hear from his word, as we've heard today, that those born of water and the Spirit who trust in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection, are marked out as Christ's own forever, we have very good reason to believe him, and we should. Let's pray. Almighty God, you are our Redeemer. Through Christ's death and resurrection, his ascension, his conquest of evil and death, you have made a way for us to enter into your kingdom. Lord, you have sent your Spirit to work within us through mundane means, through the words of others, through water, through bread, through wine, to work in our hearts, to renew us again and again and again. And so, Lord, we come before you this morning as people who need to be renewed. So, Lord, work in us this week that we might take a hold again, as you've asked us to do, to that new life that you have gifted to us. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.